Hello everyone, welcome to the very first video of an upcoming series where we'll dissect a 16th century Yemeni chronicler Shihab al-Din Ahmed bin Abdul Qadir bin Salim bin Uthman also known as the Arab Faqih who lived in the Adal Sultanate which is modern day Ethiopia and Somalia an eyewitness to the accounts and battles of Imam Ahmed bin Ibrahim al-Ghazi also known as Ahmed Gran. He, Imam Ahmed Gran, was engaged in a history-altering battle with the Christian Abyssinians and Abyssinian king Lebna Dengel, aka Wanag Sagad, as referred to by the chronicler Shihab. Numerous Islamic sultanates existed across the continent of Africa throughout history, but little is known or spoken of when it comes to African history and its impact on the Islamic world and the world as a whole. The makers of this video have gone through tremendous effort and hard work so please if you want to see more videos like this please like and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more videos on African Islamic history. Now time to travel to 16th century Abyssinia. Imam Ahmed was born in the year 1506 in a location which is not 100% certain, either Hubat, which is modern day Harar region. Some dispute that Imam was born in Zayla. However, what's not disputed is that both were under the Adal Sultanate region. The Adal Sultanate was founded by Sabr al-Din II. The Sa'd al-Din Islands in Somaliland today are named after his father Sa'd al-Din II who was a Sultan of the previous Sultanate of Ifat. After the fall of the previous Sultanate of Ifat, the Adal Sultanate was experiencing an internal struggle with a series of assassinations, first on the Sultan Muhammad bin Azar, Abu Bakr bin Sa'd al-Din upon his return from a failed jihad on the country of Abyssinia. Sultan Muhammad was assassinated by his in-law Muhammad bin Abu Bakr bin Mahfuz who was a prominent person in the country who then ruled the country after him for a year. Then in return Muhammad Abu Bakr bin Mahfuz was assassinated also. His killer was Ibrahim bin Ahmed, a ruler of the country of Khubat. The Sultanate is made of different countries which you'll see throughout this video. He, Ibrahim bin Ahmed, was from the tribe of Balo. He ruled the country for three months that preceded the assassination. After the three months, he himself was assassinated, this time by a slave of Garad Mahfuz named Wasani. Garad Mahfuz then ruled the country for three months. Soon after, he was arrested and his captor was Mansur bin Muhammad, who sent him in shackles to Zayla who was then murdered by one of the slaves of Yafa in Zayla. In his place, Emir Mansur Mahfuz bin Muhammad bin Garad Addas ruled. During this reign, Garad Mansur waged war on Garad Abun for five months, resulting in Garad Abun victory. He ruled for seven years and it was only now that the truth and justice was exercised over the land with fair authority for all. Sharia ah law was implemented, banning of alcohols, music and dancing during this time was also banned. In this period the country began to flourish. It was during Garad's reign where the story of Imam Ahmed bin Ibrahim al-Ghazi begins. Initially the Imam was just a knight under the command of then leader Garad Abun. As the storyteller Shihab tells, Garad loved Ahmed mightily when he saw how courageous and astute he was. During Garad Abun's reign, the storyteller tells, the son of the slain former Sultan Muhammad bin Azr Abu Bakr stood up with a revolt against Garad with him a band of Somalis whom he recruited from amongst the riffraff and highwaymen. They waged a bloody battle against him, killing Garad Abun bin Addas in his homeland whilst defending his country and his own family. He died a martyr's death. 
Abu Bakr then ruled over the country after Garad Abun, as the storyteller Shihab tells, he laid the country to waste. Highwaymen reappeared and so did alcohol drinks and other illicit Islamic vices. During his reign, passing travellers were harassed by highwaymen. In short, corruption reappeared and no one received justice. He was rebuked by the Quranic teachers and sheikhs of the time. Upon realizing that the Sultan Abu Bakr and his army had left the oath of the Quran and Sunnah, Imam Ahmed left the country accompanied by people of the country who were loyal to Garad Abun and true Islamic values. They assembled their forces in a country previously mentioned, Hubat, and settled there. The number of their horses at the time was 100 or more. The chronicler Shihab says, It was the custom in the land of Sa'd al-Din that every Amir had the dignity of ruling and of choosing functionaries and the right to lead a raiding party and the jihad. He had vast resources at his disposal by his right, while the Sultan had only what the Kharaj could dredge up from the country. So after this, the Imam Ahmad left Sim to go where the Sultan was, when he began to get closer to the town and made as if to enter the Sultan's presence. An extraordinary sign of the esteem of the Most High God for him was, by his grace manifested, God willed its manifestation. A swarm of bees flew by like a black cloud that overshadowed his head, until it concealed the eye of the sun from the place called Samanjud to the house of the Sultan. Upon the Imams entering the Sultan's presence, they greeted each other and exchanged pleasantries. In the meantime, the swarm of bees remained at the door until the Imam Ahmed withdrew, whereupon the bees swarmed above his head, causing harm to no one until he reached his home. The swarm of bees then returned to the tree. This was a portent for the Imam, bringing good news to him from God the Most High. The chronicler continues, he was worthy of the sign and for that reason was called thereafter the Imam. One of the witnesses to Shihab, the Shaykh Muhammad bin Ahmad al-Dahmani al-Maghribi told me the following story. Once I was asleep in the very dark of night, I saw two saintly men. I was at that time between sleep and waking. One of the two was the Sheikh Ahmad, son of the Sheikh Muhammad, son of the Sheikh Abdul Wahid Al Qarsi Al Tunsi. May God make him profitable for us. The second was our Lord, the great Sheikh, who knew God the Most High, the celebrated, the endowed with his brilliant qualities, with acceptable actions and authentic deeds, and unheard of ecstatic revelations, the divine leader, the incomparable one, the everlasting one. Our Lord the Noble Abu Bakr, son of the great and famous Sheikh Abdullah al Aydrus. May God make them both profitable for us. The two of them said to me, Do not call him Sultan and do not call him Amir, but call him Imam of the Muslims. And he said, I asked them both, The Imam of the last days? And they said to me, Yes, and this can be known from his miracles also. The chronicler continues, I learned from the sources in whom I have confidence, like Ali bin Salah al-Jabali and Ahmad bin Tahir al-Mar'awi, who both heard it from a man called Sa'd bin Yunus al-Araji, who said, When I was asleep in the darkest part of the night, I saw the Prophet, may God bless him and bring him salvation. And on his right was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, on his left was Umar ibn al-Khattab, and in front of him was Ali ibn Abi Talib. May God be satisfied with them. In front of Ali bin Abi Talib, may God do him honor, was the Imam Ahmad bin Ibrahim. So I said to him, O Messenger of God, who is this man? Who is in front of Ali bin Abi Talib? And he replied, May God bless him and grant him salvation. Through this man, Allah will subdue the country of Abyssinia. The vision occurred when the Imam was only a soldier, and the visionary who had this dream did not know him before. Apart from seeing him standing in front of Ali bin Abi Talib, 
May God do him honor. The visionary came to the city of Harar in the days of Garad Abun and recounted the dream to the people of the city who asked him, Is this Garad Abun he who you saw in your dream? And he said, No. And one Amir succeeded another in a continuous line of rulers of the city until the visionary came at a time when the Imam Ahmad was appointed to rule it. When he saw him, he recognized his appearance which he had first seen in his dream when he stood in front of our Lord Ali bin Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. The visionary said to the city, This is the man who I saw in my dream. Indeed, this is what was told to him in his vision. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever sees me in his dream has really seen me, for shaitan cannot appear in my likeness. It was truly as he saw. The vision was confirmed. Imam Ahmad ruled the country of Abyssinia and brought it peace, just as will be recalled later on, if the most merciful High God wills. They made Garad Umar al-Din their emir over them. While he was in position, they first heard of one of the patricians of the Hatti king of the Abyssinians, a Christian named Fanwell from Dawaru, present-day Hararge. The patrician invaded the country of the Muslims not too far away from Khubat where the Imam Ahmad was settled in. They plundered the country, the wives and families of the Muslims taken, and also their livestock. When Imam Ibrahim and his forces heard of this, they immediately set out for jihad and to attack the Abyssinians. Goading each other for war in the way of Allah, they met at a place called Aqam. Not knowing exactly where it is today, but the storyteller Shihab informs of a mighty river with copious water. The Muslims drew up their battle lines, the Abyssinians did the same and mobilized their cavalry. Imam Ibrahim and his forces attacked them in a single wave. The storyteller Shihab informs the fighting was so intense, choking dust everywhere at the time, all that could be heard was the thud of sword against leather shields. Imam Ibrahim attacked the middle rank of the Abyssinians, which caused them to scatter their united front, splitting them apart. He, Imam Ibrahim, charged into the midst of them and brought their cavalry to the ground. The rest of the army attacked the left flank of the Abyssinian army, which caused that flank of the Abyssinians to retreat and disperse. Then the right flank of the Abyssinians counterattacked. Amongst the right flank was the patrician Fanwell. He wore a protective armor and his head had a helmet of iron so that all you could see was his eyes peering out and his companions likewise. As the storyteller Shihab tells, the Muslims met them with hearts worthy of Islam and a zeal akin to Muhammad's. The fighting that took place was fiercer than before but the Muslims withstood them and returned with swords and blows. After this the Abyssinians turned tail and fled. In this battle many patricians were killed along with thousands of soldiers. Muslims captured 60 horses and numerous amount of weapons and mules. They took back the Muslim captives and all the livestock captured and returned them to its rightful people. On this day, not one Muslim was killed in battle. Upon hearing the result of the battle, Sultan Abu Bakr and Ali's he had with him overcame with anxiety and fear, fled the country to a town called Kidad, which was in the country of the Somalis. When Imam Ahmed and his companions heard this, they marched to Kidad and chased the Sultan out of Kidad to a place called Qarn, which had a river with a large body of water. Imam Ahmed caught up with the Sultan and his Somali forces and killed a vast amount. The remaining that survived fled, including the Sultan. The Imam took 30 horses and sacked the city. They then returned to Harar, the land of Sa'd al-Din. They hadn't settled down for long when the Sultan Abu Bakr assembled another force against the Imam and reached at the district called Harar. When the Imam heard of their coming, they withdrew and headed to a town called Khubat Ziberta, which contained a large mountain which they climbed. When the Sultan Abu Bakr got news of this, he pursued them as far as the mountain itself. 
There he besieged them in a siege that lasted between 13 and 19 days. The Imam and his companions were so exhausted by the siege that they descended down the mountain by night. A terrible battle ensued and the companions of the Imam fled. The Amir whom they had chosen to rule Umar al-Din was killed. So the Imam and the remaining companions that stayed went back to their homes. This resulted in forced mediation between the Imam and the Sultan Abu Bakr. And part of the treaty was that the Imam Ahmed and his companions were to be at service of the Sultan. This lasted a few days as the Sultan violated his pact and betrayed the Imam and his companions by confiscating their swords, their mounts and their weapons. The Imam only had three horses left. The Imams were also killed after the supposed peace pact, most notably the Emir Uthman bin Yas. The Sultan devastated the Imam's current residence, tyrannizing its citizens, sheikhs and scholars and Quran teachers. The Imam's life itself was threatened, so he fled by night from the country, taking with him three horses. He fled to his hometown, which was called at the time Zaka, a day's journey from the town of the Sultan he encountered. The Imam organized his army for the first expedition into the lands of Abyssinia. He arrived in a then Ethiopian territory called Dawaru. They executed this raid convincingly, where they amassed vast booty, horses and mules, slaves and livestock. After they doubled back wanting to return home, the Abyssinians of Dawaru, all of them, amassed a force against him. The Imam had 100 or more cavalry and the Abyssinians had so many that Shihab, the storyteller, informs you couldn't even count the amount. They pressed close upon the Muslims in a narrow defile, killing a great number of them, upon whom God had put a seal of martyrdom. The Abyssinians captured seven emirs of the Muslims, amongst them were Emir Hussein al gatturi and the Emir Zaharbui Muhammad, the Emir Abdullah, Emir Omar, Emir Uray Ahmed, Jibra'il of a Somali tribe and another unidentified Amir. The chronicler informs, may the Most High God have mercy upon them. They were heroes of the Muslims and their courage as horsemen was renowned. Regarding the fate of Amir Hussein, they took him to a secluded part of their village and removed his armor and sought to take off his outer garment as they wanted to kill him. There were seven of them wanting to kill him, bound though he was by the grace of Islam and the blessings of Muhammad وسلم, his bonds were cut and he pounced on one of the captors, taking his dagger from him and cried out with a shout, Al Jihad fi sabilillah. When they heard him crying this out, they were put to flight and fled. Though the Emir Hussein was wounded, he returned to his companions by night and soon recovered. The other Emirs remained in captivity and were sent to the king. Two of them were killed. The Imam returned to the country of the Muslims in a town called Zaka. He went to the Sultan Abu Bakr and made peace with him again, but again the Sultan's mood changed towards him. With unjust rule under his governorship, he sought to kill the Imam Ahmed, even after the learned men and sheikhs tried to do their best to reconcile between them. Ignoring all of this, the Sultan Abu Bakr declared war on Imam Ahmed. The chronicler informs, he abandoned the oath of the truth and plotted to deceive the Imam, but was duped by his own cunning, just as the Most High God says in the masterful passage in his illustrious book. The vile ruse entrails him who concocts it. The Imam killed the Sultan Abu Bakr and the country was saved from his injustice. Imam Ahmed remained in the land, putting an end to the corrupt practices and wiping out highwaymen. He ordered the town crier to announce the following. Whoever is envious of one of the Muslims will forfeit his life and his property. After the Imam appointed Umar al-Din, the Sultan's brother in his place, the country experienced peace under his sovereignty and his government. Revolutions died down, falsehood was abolished, hypocrisy ceased, tricks and dodges of the shaitan were rendered impotent and finally annihilated. The command of Allah prevailed even though they detested it. 
in the time of the Sultan Sa'd al-Din and in the time of the ones ruled after him in Harar. The Abyssinians made incursions into the country and laid it to waste multiple times so that some of the Muslim towns even paid kharaj to them. This was the situation until the Imam Ahmad ruled. He prevented the Abyssinians from doing this. The chronicler Shihab informs, in this time he would sit with the poor and show kindness. He was so merciful and humble and disdained with proud. He was sympathetic to the widows and to the orphans and just towards victim of oppression so that justice was given back to its rightful place. He was faithful to all his religious duties and the Most High says, those who should we establish them in the land will keep up prayer and pay the poor rate, command what is exemplary and forbid what is contemptible. One of the Sultans came to their Imam when his country had been torn with disputes. He had gone to live with the Somalis. He reconciled with the Imam and the latter gave him a district for his support. A tribe called Girri then came to the Imam. A dispute had arisen between them and their companions in another tribe called Marayhan, whose Emir was called Hirabu. So the Imam Ahmed sent a message to Hirabu, Emir of the Somalis, to make peace with them. While the Imam was preoccupied with his peace talks, he heard of an important patrician, a brother-in-law of the Abyssinian king Wanag Sagad. He, Dagalhan, had a vast number of patricians under him and reached the furthermost border of the Muslims. He had plundered, taken by force their wealth and made improper advances to the female members of the families, amongst whom was the mother of one of the Amirs of the Imam by the name of Abu Bakr Qattin. The Abyssinians had more than 600 cavalry. The chronicler Shihab informs their army was like a plague of locusts. Imam Ahmad had 200 horsemen. They launched the attack, setting out at the time of Asr prayer. As they marched day and night until they reached the mighty river called Aqam at sunset on the second day where they camped. The Imam sent a small band of soldiers to gain intel, but not one of them returned with news. So after this, he sent one of his emirs by the name of Hussein al gatturi as his informant with seven cavalrymen. They reached the proximity of the Abyssinian army, which was an immense force, so they doubled back to notify the Imam. The Imam then set out for the Abyssinian army until they arrived at a place that the only barrier between them and the two armies was a fortified mountain. They encamped there and the Imam himself, along with four other knights, climbed the mountain. Amongst these knights was the Wazir Adoli, the Amir Baraddah, and the Amir Ali. They reached the vantage point and now were overlooking the Abyssinians who made their camp in a place called Dir. Their lights were blazing. The Imam and his knights then scaled back down the mountain and settled down for the night. The next day the Abyssinians set out for their own territory with the Imam and his army on their heels without the Abyssinians knowing. As the chronicler informs, how beautiful before the breaking of dawn is the voice of the herald. <laughs> to the races of the men noble in rank, who gave their lives so high-mendedly in order to please the magnanimous one. On horseback, they are like lions, dismounted, they are the tent pegs of this country. While they were chasing the Abyssinians, one of the Abyssinians turned around and saw the Muslims in their rear and notified his companions. And all of them wheeled around and saw the Muslims behind them. They then drew up their battle lines, fixing their positions. The Imam likewise arrayed his forces to the right, to the left, to the center, and then the advance proceeded. The Muslims drew near, as compact as a construction whose parts held together in such a way that there was no space between them. Then the cavalry charged. The first Muslim knight to do so was Faharsan Sultan bin Ali of the tribe of Yamli. After yelling, Allahu Akbar, he attacked the Abyssinians, breaking through their lines, scattering their massed forces and killing a group of them. He took prisoner one of the patricians, Takla. He grabbed him and pulled him from his saddle and took him into the presence of the Imam, who sent him to Arabia. The Amir Ali also attacked, killing many of them and capturing another patrician who was also presented to the Imam. The chronicler Shihab informs, 
the Muslims appeared in the battle like savage lions galloping full tilt with spears held high. Army merging with army, the wretched infidels stood their ground before the attack of the noble Muslims. As the tide of the battle rolled on relentlessly, with horses interlocked with horses and infantry with infantry, on that day nothing was to be seen but cut off heads, spirits in throes of death and palms of hands flying in the air. The Muslims cried out with a mighty cry, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. All of the tribes responded and the earth trembled under them. On that day, the battle cry of the Muslims was Yahoo, 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 and dismay fell upon the Abyssinians who began to desert. The Imam showed himself to be one of steady heart. No Abyssinian soldier came near him without being tossed to the ground and he lunged with his spear at no one whom he did not slaughter. The chronicler Shihab witnesses, so many Abyssinians, thousands have died on this day as the Muslims took their possessions and took 484 prisoners. They returned the stolen wealth back to their rightful owners and on this day, no Muslim soldier died with only a few suffering light wounds which they fully recovered from. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to the channel. If you really want to see the next video, please let us know in the comments what you think.